Well, once more, brethren, as we gird up the loins of our mind, let's ask God for the present and powerful assistance of His Holy Spirit as we engage mind and heart in seeking to know better how to minister to His needy sheep. Let's pray together. Father, we are mindful of your word which says that so often we receive not because we ask not, and yet other times to our shame we ask but do not receive because we ask to consume things upon our own natural desires. But our Father, as we bow before you now, asking for the Holy Spirit's presence and grace and power to be operative in this hour. We have every confidence that by your grace we are not asking for his presence, ministry, and power for any other reason than that we should be made better servants of Christ, better able to be Christ's hands and heart and mouth and guides to the people whom he purchased with his own precious blood. So we ask you to be our portion throughout this entire lecture. Send your spirit upon us as together we plead for this blessing through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Well, brethren, as we continue our consideration of the presuppositional framework of the individual care of Christ's sheep, or what is generally called pastoral counseling, let me briefly remind you of the ground we've already covered. After establishing that all, cult, all counsel does indeed have a presuppositional framework, we then focused our attention upon the presuppositions that should shape and mold the thinking and speaking of the counselor, first of all with respect to himself. Who am I as I counsel? And then the presuppositions we should have with respect to the person we are counseling. Now in this hour, we move on to the third area of presuppositional consideration, and that is the presuppositions with respect to the counsel given. And I've expressed the content of this lecture primarily in three statements, each one beginning with the words, we must have. So as we think of the counsel we are to give, first of all then, we must have a conviction concerning the primacy and sufficiency of Scripture as the major source material for pastoral counseling. And once again, I've tried to shave and cut and cull and replace words to state this element of our presuppositional framework as accurately as I know how. We must have a conviction concerning the primacy, what has primacy is in the first place, and the sufficiency, its adequacy of Scripture as the major source. I did not say exclusive source. I believe that would turn the statement into error. But as the major source material for pastoral counseling. If our preaching from the pulpit is true preaching, it is in its very essence the proclamation, explanation, and application of the scriptures to the gathered people of God. Now, although the circumstances are dramatically different, the essence of what we are doing in pastoral counseling is substantially the same. We are explaining and applying the Word of God to the mind and heart of the one sitting before us. The circumstances are different. It's not the public gathering, the office behind the pulpit, 
But in our office, elders, pastors, in our function, feed the flock of God, they are precisely the same. And just as certainly as I trust, none of us would be caught dead using our pulpits as a sounding board for Sigmund Freud, for Rogers, Skinner, Maurer, or any other psychological or psychiatric guru, we should not be caught dead in our studies doing this with one of Christ's blood-bought sheep. Now, there have been a number of so-called experts in this matter of pastoral counseling who are labeled as integrationists. They have a fundamental conviction that God has given a great body of valid insight concerning the struggles and problems and needs of believers, and he's revealed how to address those problems in totally non-Christian men, many of them patently anti-Christian men, and they seek to integrate into their perspectives in pastoral counseling the so-called profound insights of these ungodly, unscriptural men and their pronouncements. Not all integrationists are that bad, but many of them are, especially when they then take what they have gleaned from these non-Christian thinkers who have none of the presuppositions that I've already covered with you. Their whole presuppositional framework is at many points diametrically opposed to these biblical truths. And they try then to fit them into a verse here and a verse there and an incident here and an incident there to give a biblical flavor to this integrationist council. But that's all it is. It's integrationist pagan council with a flavor of biblical substance by a text here, a text there, an incident here, an incident there. According to the scriptures, if we ask the question, how are men and women brought to maturity in Christ? The answer's clear. Jesus prays, Father, sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. John 17, 17. Or Ephesians 4, 15. Speaking truth in love, they grow up into him in all things. If we ask a further question, how are people to be warned to avoid certain spiritual dangers? Psalm 19, verses 7 to 11, tell us it is by the precepts of God. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in the keeping of them there is great reward. If we have someone sitting before us dissatisfied with where he or she is at in their Christian experience, and they want greater blessedness, gospel fullness of life. Where are they to find it? Psalm 1. Oh, the blessednesses of the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law doth he meditate day and night. So if we regard pastoral counseling as a distinct ministerial duty and privilege, what are we to learn from 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17? We are to learn that the same scriptures that made Timothy wise unto salvation are also profitable by their teaching, reproof, correction, instruction to make him a man of God thoroughly furnished unto every good work. And it's at this point, again, that uh, J. Adams was bold to confront the whole integrationist mentality and practice, and he wrote as follows in answer to the question, what is the basis for Christian counseling? I quote him, the Christian's basis for counseling 
And the basis for a Christian's counseling is nothing other than the scriptures of the Old and the New Testament. The Bible is his counseling textbook. Why, you ask? After all, the Christian doesn't use the Bible as his basis for scores of other activities in which he engages, such as engineering, architecture, music. So why should we insist that the scriptures are the basis for counseling? The answer to that question is at once both simple and profound. Because of its simplicity, don't miss the profundity of its implications. The Bible is the basis for a Christian counseling because it deals with the same issues that all counseling does. The Bible was given to help men to come to saving faith in Christ and then to transform believers into his image. The Holy Spirit uses as an adequate instrument that he says has the power to do so. That in substance is what 2 Timothy 3, 15 to 17 say. But note, these verses God assigns this life calling of transforming lives by the word of God to the man of God. A phrase Paul picks up from the Old Testament designation for a prophet and uses in the pastoral epistles to refer to the Christian minister. And let me repeat, the Holy Spirit strongly declares that the Bible fully equips him for this work. So then, it is because counseling, the process of helping others to love God and their neighbor, is part of the ministry of the Word, just as preaching is, that it is unthinkable to use any other text just as it would be unthinkable to do so in preaching. A ministry of the word is not such when it is based on substitutes. And then he goes on in that quote that's in your notes, that God does not appreciate competition in the accomplishment, accomplishment of his purposes and of his saving designs. And so... We must have, then, this conviction concerning the primacy and the sufficiency of Scripture as the major source material for pastoral counseling. Now, let me make several applications. If we really embrace that presupposition, it will prod us to live in the Scriptures that we may be increasingly furnished for this good work. I read before we prayed in the earlier hour from Isaiah 50. Our Lord is able to speak a word to him that is weary because his own ear is open morning by morning to hear as one who is taught. In Jeremiah 23, 28 and 29, there's a difference between the mere straw of men's thoughts and the living, powerful Word of God described in Hebrews as a sharp sword, a two-edged sword, God's mighty sword for accomplishing His purposes. It is certainly proper to convey biblical concepts in something other than the actual words of Scripture. You are not failing to preach the word if you do something more than simply string a hundred texts together and quote them on Sunday morning. You will say many things that are not a direct quotation of a phrase or a paragraph of Scripture, but because they reflect the teaching of Scripture, you are preaching the word. Well, in the same way in your counsel. Your counsel is not necessarily unbiblical unless you're quoting a text. However, there is something peculiarly powerful about the Word of God being conveyed in its own native form of sound words, as Paul calls them. Hence, an open Bible on your desk and an open Bible in the lap of the one you are counseling is never out of order. 
There will be times when it will be very helpful for you to say, now, now, brother or sister, please read this text out loud. He reads it out loud. And then you say, what does that text obviously say concerning the situation concerning which we've come to me? Well, I'm not sure I see that. Well, then let me try to help you to see it. And then by questions and interaction, instead of standing back and doing the exposition for them, you guide them into the exposition so that they see the thing coming directly out of their own Bibles on their own laps. That's not a Rogerian sitting back grunting and hoping people will discover the answer to their own problems. That's a ministry of the Word. The form of it is adjusted to the situation of the counseling setting. Then the second presupposition that must be operative in our minds when we counsel others is this. We must possess a conviction concerning the reality, function, and indispensability of general revelation and common grace in our pastoral counseling. Let me explain, first of all, the terms. By general revelation, we refer to that which God has made known, revealed, concerning reality as it is embedded in the world within us, the world around us, outside us, and above us. It is God's self-disclosure to us, hence it is called revelation. And since it is open to all men, everywhere, at all times, it is designated general revelation. A classic Old Testament passage, of course, is Psalm 19, 1 to 6. The heavens declare, it's revelatory, the heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament shows forth His handiwork, day unto day, night unto night. God is revealing His power, His wisdom, His order, His might, His care over His creation in this aspect of general revelation. Likewise, Romans 1, 18 and following, the Apostle speaks of that which may be known of God is revealed. It's revelatory data. It's there to be seen, to be understood, and to be responded to in an appropriate way. And when they refuse that revelation, God gives them over to base things that are what? Against nature. They do that which is against nature. You don't need to have the Bible to tell you that sexual intimacy is to be intended between a man and a woman. Just look at the way God made the man and made the woman and the way they fit together. You don't need to have the Bible telling you only a man and a woman should fit together in sexual intimacy. That's a part of general revelation. But it's not only the world without and around us, but the world within us. Romans 2, 14 to 15, Paul speaks of the function of conscience. And here, without wanting to be overly fastidious, brethren, I would like to take just a little momentary digression to encourage you to be a little more precise in your language when you speak of this aspect of general revelation. Look at verse 14 of Romans 2. For when the Gentiles that have not the law do by nature the things of the law, these not having the law are the law unto themselves, in that, not that they show the law written on their hearts, that's a distinctive new covenant privilege and blessing, in that they show the work of the law written on their hearts, in other words, there is something in the internal function of the heart that comes to light in the actings of conscience, their thoughts one with another, accusing or else excusing them. And Professor Murray was the first one that made me sensitive to this 
because when I would hear the terminology, God's written his law on the heart of every man. No, he hasn't. He wrote it clearly on Adam. And in the fall, that work was not obliterated. And some of it yet remains even in the basis of men, but it's the work of the law written on the heart, not the law itself written on the heart. And as I say, I don't want to be overly fastidious, but sensitive people will be troubled if we talk about unregenerate people having the law written on the heart, and then they read, God says in the new covenant, I'll take out the heart of stone, I'll write my law upon the heart. And when we ask the question, where does this sense of guilt or this sense of an action being right or wrong come from. This is general revelation by looking at the world within. And then the world around us, Paul says in Acts 14, 17, God has not left himself without a witness. And that witness is his general benevolence. He provides food and rain and sunshine. These are the things that constitute general revelation. And why is it essential to uh, understand something of common grace? Well, let me quote from Baker's Dictionary of Theology what we mean by the term common grace. The doctrine of common grace, says Herman Boving, enables one to recognize and appreciate all that is good and beautiful in the world while at the same time holding unreservedly to the absolute character of the Christian religion. Whereas special grace regenerates the hearts of men, common grace, number one, restrains the destructive process of sin within mankind in general and enables men, though not born again, to develop the latent forces of the universe and thus make a positive contribution to the fulfillment of the cultural mandate given to men through the first man, Adam, in paradise. And so common grace restrains evil, enables men to do good things and to discover good things, what Edward would call are good bad works or are bad good works. They are never good in terms of acceptable to God, but they are good in their essence. The example for me that is so current, when that doctor told me to drop my trousers and stuck those, I don't know how many cc's of steroid in my left buttocks on Monday, he could have been an absolute pagan, trained as an absolute pagan without an ounce of Christian grace, in God's common grace, enabling men to discover how you can deal with someone with problems in his middle ears to help him so he can stand up on his own. That's God's grace. We don't deserve those gifts, but they are his common grace. And likewise, in the matter of general revelation, God gives people insights to the function of the human body and the human physiology, whether they are saved or not saved. Now, what application does all of that have to your presuppositions as you counsel one of God's sheep? For example, someone may come to you, and as you begin to try to diagnose the problem, it's clear they have a serious problem of crippling depression leading to a kind of paralysis with respect to duty. They've lost their zeal to do the duty set before them. They are vulnerable to guilt, inability to fulfill their basic responsibilities of adult life. If you have little conviction or none concerning the reality, function, and indispensability of common grace, you will most likely immediately go to a default position of mind. You've either got some sin you're not mortifying, some duty you are willfully refusing to fulfill, 
or you've got some fractured relationship with another brother or sister or human being you're not willing to rectify. Your default position will immediately be your problem is essentially, fundamentally spiritual and needs exclusively the application of the Word of God. I'm prepared to say I believe that is a wrong way to deal with Christ's sheep. We're forgetting there is such a thing as general revelation and operations of God's common grace that may be needed in this situation. Well, rather than having a default position of a serious spiritual problem, you may ask the question, how long has it been since you've had your thyroid tested? Have you ever had a problem with an underactive thyroid? An underactive thyroid can produce many manifestations that seem to be like spiritual problems. There are others who have some fundamental deficiencies in their blood chemistry. How long has it been since you've had a thorough blood workup? Simple question. Often I have found when someone seemed to have complex, serious problems, my first counsel has been, I want you to go to a reputable, responsible, experienced physician and have a thorough physical. Start there to exclude as much as possible that the problem is not fundamentally rooted in some physiological issue rather than some explicitly spiritual issue. Now it's true that there has been a tremendous abuse of that perspective, highlighted in such books as Edward Welsh's book, Blame It on the Brain. Everything gets blamed on biochemical deficiencies in the function of the brain, keeping the synapses from functioning properly and the signals going from one little fiber to another little fiber, and if we can just get the chemistry of the brain sorted out, everything will be sorted out. There's been a great abuse of it. He has written convincingly and helpfully in his book, Blame It on the Brain, and also in his book entitled, The Counselor's Guide to the Brain and Its Disorders. But in that second book, he has two clear paragraphs where he would say amen to everything I'm saying to you, where general revelation has made it abundantly clear that there can be serious, apparently spiritual problems, the root of which is not spiritual or the roots of which are not primarily spiritual but physiological having to do with the function of the brain. So don't assume a default conclusion that the issue is sin or relational. And at this point, I must mention again the excellent little book by Dr. David Murray, Christians Get Depressed Too. It deals primarily with the phenomena of depression, and his chapter at the end called An Appendix is entitled On the Sufficiency of Scripture. And in demonstrating what he believes, and I share that conviction with him, sufficiency of Scripture really means, it does not mean that we exclude the revelatory data of nature. I quote him now, There is an area where I fear many sincere believers are going wrong overreacting to attacks on the sufficiency of Scripture, they are going to an unbiblical, quote, extreme sufficiency position, thereby denying themselves many of God's riches. The sufficiency of Scripture does not mean that we should shun every non-biblical source of knowledge. What God's revealed in general revelation is God's revelatory data, and he wants us to read it and to respond to it intelligently and believingly and submissively as the people of God. As the confession makes clear, even in some areas of worship and church government, we must learn from what the human community has found helpful and useful. 
our confession states that some things concerning the government and worship of the church that are not expressly revealed in Scripture, we must look to the light of nature and common human experience. This is being open to general revelation, even in the sacred matter of the worship of God. The sufficiency of Scripture means we don't need any more special revelation. We don't need any more inspired, inerrant words. In the Bible God has given us, we have the perfect standard. The same goes for time management. I'm sorry, I skipped a page. For judging all knowledge, all other knowledge stands under the judgment of the Bible. Then he goes on to quote Calvin and Calvin's famous analogy of the spectacles. And in that section, he quotes Calvin saying, The human mind, however much fallen and perverted from its original integrity, is still adorned and invested with admirable gifts from its creator. We will be careful not to reject or condemn truth wherever it appears. If we regard, still quoting Calvin, the Spirit of God as the sole foundation of truth, we shall neither reject the truth itself nor despise it wherever it shall appear unless we wish to dishonor the Spirit of God. Shall we say that the philosophers were blind in their fine observation and artful description of nature? No, we cannot read the writings of the ancients on these subjects without great admiration. But if the Lord has willed that we be helped in physics, dialectic, mathematics, and other like disciplines by the work and ministry of the ungodly, let us use this assistance. For if we neglect God's gift freely offered in these arts, we ought to suffer just punishment for our sloth. And so I set before you what I believe is crucial, that in seeking to be wise, responsible counselors, we recognize the necessity of general revelation in common grace. Let me make a specific application to this. God has allowed men, unconverted, godless men, to discover certain patterns of the behavior that help people seeking to overcome nicotine addiction. Smoke stoppers is the embodiment of that discovery as they've dealt with people seeking to throw off without any reference to the grace of God or even a higher power to my knowledge in smoke stoppers. They have found the certain physiological patterns that come with cold turkey withdrawal and all the other things that are open to our observation in general revelation. And for a Christian who wants to be done with his addiction to nicotine, to go to smoke stoppers, with this attitude, Lord Jesus, without you, I can do nothing. If it's going to please you to use this framework to deliver me from this addiction that I know is sinful, it is destructive to this temple of the Holy Spirit, I want to be done with a bloodied conscience and tempting you and inviting other illnesses with it. Lord Jesus, trusting in you, abiding in you, bless this regimen of an effort to be done with this addiction. He must go with the disposition of Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ. Or Romans 8.13. Without the work of your spirit, Lord, no group of smoke stoppers multiplied by a thousand will deliver me. My dependence is upon you. I could not discourage a sheep under my care from going that course with that disposition bringing together both the insights of general revelation and the distinctive dynamics of the grace of God as a new creature in Christ. In use of any helpful devices rooted in general revelation and common grace, 
the Christian must always assess his particular problem by biblical norms and must be motivated and empowered by the provisions of God's grace if he's to deal effectively with the issue. My only point is to underscore that these unique provisions of special grace do not necessarily negate the place of those provisions rooted in general revelation and in common grace. Again, to come back to a very current example, I prayed God's blessing upon those vials of steroids sitting on the doctor's shelf, and when he drew them into his syringe and plunged them into my butt, my prayer was, O oh God, bless these means. If I did anything other than that, then what God says about Asa would be said of me. He sought not to the Lord, but to the physician. Or Jeremiah 17, 5, Cursed be he that trust in man. Our trust is in God, but that does not mean we cut ourselves off from things God may have provided in the conduit of general revelation and of common grace. In a very real sense, the bringing together of these two conduits of God's provision explicitly revealed in those instances where God uses medicine and human means in conjunction with his healing grace and power. And I want to cite just two of them from the scriptures. You remember God through the prophet tells Hezekiah he's dying. He cries to God, spare me, remember my deeds. The prophet comes back and says, God's going to give you 18 years. You're going to live. You shall not die, but live. But then God says to the prophet, go put a poultice on his boil. Well, what healed him, the poultice or God's promise and power? It was God's promise and power working by means with and through the poultice on his boil. God did the healing, but he used this combination of that which could be discovered in general revelation that some kind of, wasn't it figs? I think it was, was I, I, just, I think it was figs. The texts are there, you can look it up. My brain has failed me at that point. And then 1 Timothy 5.23, Paul is very conscious that Timothy has chronic gastrointestinal problems. He's very conscious of it. And other ailments. He was a sickly man. So as he's writing to him all the responsibilities he has at Ephesus and lays upon this poor sickly young man this tremendous litany of pastoral duties, he says, Timothy, I also know that probably out of conscience sake, for yourself, fearful you might abuse alcohol or that you might not offend any who would think less of you in the use of it, no longer be a drinker of water only, but pray more, fast more, that God would touch you. No, be no longer a drinker of water only, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your oft infirmities. It was known at that time in the understanding of general revelation that the local wine had some medicinal positive influence upon someone with Timothy's kinds of ailments. And so Paul becomes an unlicensed, unregistered, uncertified doctor and says, take a little wine for your stomach's sake and your oft infirmities. And here I do want to quote from Brooks, because the Puritans were masters with all the limitations of what they knew from general revelation. They were very careful to emphasize this presupposition. This is what Brooks says, volume 3, page 296. Melancholy is a dark and dusky humor. We would call it chronic depression which disturbs both soul and body, and the cure of it belongs rather to the physician than to the divine, that is, the pastor. It is a most pestilent humor where it abounds. 
One calls it a balneum diaboli, the devil's bath. It is a humor that unfits the man for all sorts of services, but especially those that concern his soul. Here is a condition that has its heightened expression in the case of the man's soul. Am I really a Christian? Am I not? Am I a servant of the devil? He's in the place where his mind cannot function properly to process reality about the true state of his soul, his spiritual estate, his everlasting condition. The melancholy person tries the physician, grieves the minister, wounds relations, and makes sport for the devil. There are five sorts of persons that the devil makes his ass to ride in triumph upon. The ignorant person, the unbelieving person, the proud person, the hypocritical person, and the melancholy person. Melancholy is a disease that works strange passions, strange imaginations, and strange conclusions. There you would think he was almost describing someone who was extremely paranoid. And if you've ever dealt with anyone in that condition, you can relate to this. They are convinced that somebody's tying a bomb under the front end of their car after church and they're fearful to get in their car. That's not theoretical. That's part of my pastoral experience. And try as I could to try to help this man get his brain sorted out where it could process facts and reality, it was utterly impossible. I ended up calling Jay Adams. I said, what do I do with this man? He said, get him hospitalized and medicated until he can begin to deal with reality in terms of what reality is. And that's what I had to do. And then when the medication had helped unscramble whatever was scrambled in the function of his brain chemistry, we could then deal realistically. Then you could take him by the hand if he said, I think there's something under my car and say, no, look, come on, let's go look. And he could process what you were doing. But when there's a breakdown in this process factory called the human brain, there are times when it's necessary to take some of the at least tentative insights of general revelation and employ them for the help of God's people. And that's why I say we must not only have a conviction concerning the scriptures as the primary source of our counseling, but also a conviction concerning the place of common grace and general revelation. And while I was reworking these materials, I was reading for the first time Ian Murray's marvelous biography of uh, Lloyd-Jones called The First Forty Years. And I came across the quote that you have he has just been describing a man who was having tremendous trouble with assurance of salvation and how the doctor dealt with him. And then he comments, as the above description reveals, Dr. Lloyd-Jones had come to the conclusion that the man needed purely spiritual help. And as he began to speak to him in terms of scripture, and of the true basis for an assurance of salvation, the apparently deranged man slowly became as calm as a child. He was not completely delivered at once. A week or so later, although he lived at Bridgend, some distance from Aberavon, he was back at the same man's door, seemingly as distressed as before. Once more, the truth of Scripture was urged upon him, and with less difficulty than before, he came to rest on them afresh. Other similar visits followed, and the man was clearly reestablished in the assurance of the love of Christ, and he needed no further help. Scripture cured him. But then Ian goes on to write, This experience confirmed Dr. Lloyd-Jones in a principle which he regarded as crucial in counseling. 
he saw that just as it is disastrous to attempt to treat a case of real physical or mental illness with spiritual remedies, so it is equally wrong to treat a spiritual case with what may be of benefits to those who are generally, uh, genuinely mentally ill. Yet as symptoms of the two classes can be very similar, how can one discern to which class a distressed person in need of help belongs? His conclusion was that where in a regenerate person, where you could have the presuppositions of what's in them and for them in Jesus Christ, that in a regenerate person, distress arises out of a sense of sin and an absence of assurance. In other words, where the condition has spiritual causes, then the person will respond to a correct application of the truths and promises of Scripture suited for that condition. Such response may not be immediate in total, but it will be recognizable to the careful pastor. On the other hand, where this use of Scripture is of no avail in removing the distress of persons of whom there is reason to believe they are Christians, then the likelihood is that the medical psychiatric assistance should be sought, believing again that in that field there are some revelatory materials that can be put to use in proper, wise counseling. One of the things that Dr. Murray says in his book that I greatly appreciated, he said this, I'm paraphrasing him, there is no more complex organ in the entire human physiology than the human brain. All of the studies being done have just scratched the surface of this marvelous lump of gray stuff that hangs between our ears. And Professor Murray says this. He says, if this is the most complex organ, this processing factory uh, of the soul and of the mind and spirit and the world around us and about us and within us, above us, he said, sin has affected the totality of our physiology and our sanctification, to what extent it may touch even some of our physical capacities, is not complete in this world in any facet of our physiology. And to say in essence that the grace of God has put some kind of a shield around the brain of a Christian, that the chemistry of the brain will never become imbalanced so that the person needs the assistance of medications calculated to correct that imbalance of brain chemistry is to take a doctrine of sanctification that's not taught in the Bible. The influences of sin will be found in my noetic faculties as well as in my cranky joints and in my messed up labyrinth and all the other things that we have to live with. And so, brethren, while it's not easy to tread rightly in this area, I believe we must recognize it is an area that we must continually look to God for grace and light and assistance as we seek by His power to counsel people <coughs> in a biblical and God-honoring way. And then move on to the third we must possess. We must possess a conviction respecting the difference between authoritative counsel based on the clear teaching of the Word of God and wise personal advice based upon a combination of many things. We've got to have a conviction there's a difference between the two. Even as an apostle, Paul knew the difference when he's trying to sort out the problems at Corinth uh, concerning marriage and singleness, etc. He says in 1 Corinthians 7, 25 to 28, here's my counsel. I think I have the spirit in it. It is that if you're single, don't seek a wife. If you're married, don't leave your wife. That's my counsel. But if any man marries, 
he has not sinned. He understood the difference between a Christ-inspired apostolic directive given as an imperative and wise spiritual counsel given by an apostle who's got his head screwed on right. And he knew the difference. Here's my counsel, but if you do otherwise, you have not sinned. And likewise, he speaks in 1 Corinthians 16, 12 and other places in the epistles when he gave directives, not orders, to different ones, come with me here, go there. But he says, but it was not his mind to do so, but he'll come to you when he can. He was giving counsel and he was not binding the conscience. And this is crucial in our counseling for the simple reason that God has given us no authority to bind the conscience of his people beyond the clear teaching of the word of God. And we have that beautiful statement in our London Baptist Confession taken as well from the Westminster. God alone is Lord of the conscience and have left it free from the doctrines and commandments of men which are in anything contrary to his word or not contained in it. And therefore we do not want to violate the conscience of any one of God's people as we seek to counsel them. But on the other hand, this perspective is not intended to undermine all the scriptures that tell us that it is wise to listen to and to heed the counsel of wise men. And I've listed the text, Proverbs 12, 15, 19, 20, 24, 6, and 11, 14. And as I was fishing around in some old uh, correspondence, I found a beautiful example of this. And this is a section of a letter from my beloved friend, Ashiel Blaze at a time when he was being urged to go to Africa, to several African countries. And so he responds by saying, I now come to the second matter raised in your letter, the trip to Africa. Although I would have preferred you to have gone uh, to urge me to, me, Albert N., I was invited to Zambia. I would have preferred you to have gone to Zambia this year but for the reasons given and the counsel of my fellow office bearers, I am willing to go. The most difficult and disliked part was the suggestion to go to Nigeria. To be perfectly frank, I have no guts for that trip. The reports of it are so sickening that both my mind and my heart are closed to it. Notwithstanding, I honestly made my convictions known to the men at our joint board meeting on January 26 and placed myself under their authority to be willing to do whatever they suggested. They came very close to commanding me to go. They didn't command, became very close to commanding me to go and I must submit. If I don't, I will undermine all I've been teaching them for a decade and a half. I'm thankful to the Lord that he's appointed fellow office berries to knock objectivity in us when we're too pessimistic and subjective to bring us back to biblical reality when we are too optimistic with blinkers on. These may be the words of a coward, but not of an inflexible heavy shepherd. I will write to Conrad. <laughs> A beautiful example of this man steeped in the scriptures, conscious of his identity as a servant of Christ, but when counsel was such and it was unified from the eldership here that he ought to go, he said, I'll stuff all of my native reluctance and all of my native antipathy to going and I will submit to counsel. So we need to instruct our people because some people will say, well, there's no text for that. But there is a consensus of godly wisdom. Don't be a fool. The scripture says, he that hearkens unto counsel is wise. And the opposite of being wise is being a fool. Don't be a fool and try to entreat people to heed counsel. 
So these then are the three fundamental presuppositions regarding the counsel we give to others. And I believe they must become part of our spiritual and mental bloodstream as we attempt to engage in this vital aspect of pastoral duty. Now we come to what I'm calling this overarching presupposition of all pastoral counseling. In one sense, it is not the fourth. It is the first, the second, third, all of them together. This is the overarching presupposition that ought to be present in all of our counseling. And I'll state it this way. We must have a biblically based and constantly active conviction regarding the place of the Holy Spirit's ministry in effective pastoral counseling. First of all, the necessity for the Holy Spirit's present and active ministry demonstrated. Since we are dealing in counseling with matters pertaining to sanctification, except in cases of real physical needs, the issues in which we are trafficking are mortification of sin, transformation or confirmation to the image of Christ, or to speak in terms of the Great Commission, helping people to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And according to the scriptures, it is only by the present agency and operation of the Holy Spirit that this ongoing work of mortification and transformation is made effective in the heart and life of a believer. Romans 8, 13, if you by the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the flesh, we are transformed into the same image even by the Lord, the Spirit. 2 Corinthians 3.18, Philippians 2.13, Work out because God is at work in you, both to will and to work. Galatians 5.16, Walk by the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of of the flesh. Galatians 5, and 23, but the fruit of the Spirit is. And then with regard to illumination and insight, Ephesians 1, 15, Paul prays that God would give to the Ephesians the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of himself, that they might know who and what they are and have in Jesus Christ, the very things we considered earlier in the previous lecture. His presence is absolutely essential in the matter of the mortification, dealing with sin, the acquisition of evangelical graces. But furthermore, since evangelical motives must permeate our counsel and the response of our people, it is the Holy Spirit who takes the things of Christ and makes them real to the hearts of his people. If with Paul we're to say, for the love of Christ constrains me, holds me in its grip, how do we have that sense of the felt constraint? Romans 5 answers, the Holy Spirit has been shed abroad in our hearts. It's by the Spirit that we have the felt sense of the constraining grace of Christ? What is it that gives us the consciousness of our sonship and all of its privileges? It's the Spirit who has been given to us, enabling us to cry, Abba, Father. Add to these realities the fact that in our counseling session, we're seeking to bring the person we are counseling to accurate views of self, of sin, Christ, the work of the Spirit. And according to John 16, 8, that's not our function. It is the function of the Spirit. When He has come, He will convict the world of sin. When there is the need for insight and understanding, the Ephesians 1 passage, other portions from the upper room discourse, this is the necessity for the Spirit's present active ministry in our counseling that is just as real as the necessity 
for that ministry when we stand in our pulpits. Then let me make some application. If we really believe that, we will be careful not to undertake any counseling session while knowingly grieving the Holy Spirit in our own hearts and lives. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God because a grieved spirit becomes a withdrawn spirit. And then we become like the one described in Judges 16, 20, Samson wist not that the Spirit had left him. What a tragic thing to come to a counseling session, be left at the mercy of our own pathetic resources because we've been too proud before we came to the session to say to our wives, dear, in that situation we talked about after supper, I really was a bit snotty in my response to you. That was sin. I've asked God's forgiveness. Dear, will you forgive me? For Christ's sake, my dear, I do forgive you. Or you've been short with one of the children around the table and snapped at them. You know you got a counseling session an hour later. Don't go into that counseling session until you resolve the issue, humbled yourself, confessed your sin to your child, asked forgiveness. Be desperate that according to your own present activity of conscience, you can say with Paul, Acts 24, 16, I have a conscience void of offense always, both to God and to man. And then furthermore, if we are desperate to know the Spirit's help, we will come to our counseling sessions in a prayerful attitude. We will not come feeling, oh, I've been down this road before, I know the road markers, I'll find my way through. We need to come to each counseling session as we need to come to our pulpits each time as though it were the first time. I shock young men who've known me for years when I'm able to be with them and preaching for them in a series of meetings and we pray together. And then before we come out, I say to them, my brother, every time is like the first time. If God doesn't come, no backup shoot, we bounce on the deck. We need the same disposition. Cursed be the man that trusts in man. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord. And thirdly, we will then consciously seek to create a climate of dependence upon the Holy Spirit in the counseling session itself. We may want to read from Isaiah 9, 6 and Isaiah 11, 2 that Christ is the wonderful counselor. The spirit of wisdom and knowledge is upon him. My dear brother, my dear sister, as we come to this session, the wisdom needed to sort out the concerns does not lie in me, your pastor, and it doesn't lie in you, but we have a wonderful counselor. We have one who knows us through and through, who loves us, who's concerned for us. Let's together, not as a little bit of a formal introduction to the session, but as the true expression of our felt sense of need for Christ's present ministry, let us pray and ask him to draw near and to help us. And then I've given you those quotes from E.J. Young on those passages, and I trust you find them helpful. But now I want to say a word quickly. Having looked at the necessity for the Spirit's ministry and the implications of it, the nature of of the Holy Spirit's ministry in our counseling activities. What's the nature? How will we know? In what framework can we expect the Spirit's assistance? Well, let me state it this way. The Holy Spirit works by us and within us as rational human beings. He does not work against us or without us but always with us and by us. Now, it may take you a while to absorb that, but that's the nature of the Spirit's ministry. Paul could say, I agonize. Whew, Paul's working. 
according to his working, which works in me mightily. There's the conjunction. I agonize. I engage all of the faculties of my redeemed humanity in the highest concentration of their activity and expression, and all the while I'm conscious as I do so in dependence upon God the Spirit that He's working in me mightily. As I expend my might to do my task, He's expending His might in me and through the exercise of my might. And in The light of these realities, this God who works in this way by means of his word, we will engage all of the faculties of our redeemed humanity in the labor of pastoral counseling. Paul tells Timothy to stir into flame the gift of God that is in him. He admonishes him to give himself wholly to his responsibilities He commands all believers, whatever your hand finds to do, do with all of your might as unto the Lord. And as I said in another lecture, few things are more demanding than concentrated, empathetic, whole-souled, whole-mind, whole-body engagement in pastoral counseling while all the time attempting to look like you're rather laid back so you don't intimidate the person sitting across from you. While you're listening intently, you don't gaze at them and make them feel intimidated. You've got to be doing it just as much as if you really were. But you've got to look like you're laid back and just listening and absorbing and processing and not in any way intimidating. And then I want to say a word not only about the necessity and nature of the Spirit's ministry, but the sovereignty of the Spirit's ministry is a crucial aspect, and it must be considered in any biblical view of pastoral counseling. You know the text as well as I do. The wind blows where it wills. You cannot tell whence it comes, whence it goes, So is everyone that is born of the Spirit, yes, and so is everyone as he is matured by the Spirit. One of the most frustrating things you will experience if you don't believe in the Spirit's sovereignty in the maturation of the people you are counseling just as much as you believe in his sovereignty in regenerating those to whom you preach week after week, you'll be frustrated no end. You've got to recognize it is God who works in his people to will and to work in his time and in his way and with his apportioned degree of efficiency, not us. And it's one of the hard things to come to grips with, but it's nonetheless true. That's why Paul had to say in 1 Corinthians 3, one sows, one waters, it is God who gives the increase. And if we believe that, then it will have some practical effects. We should not be surprised if all results are uneven. We put the same input to a same situation. One person after one or two sessions comes here. Another one, he's still crawling down here. Mr. Ready to Halt still has his crutches. (laughs) You've done your best to get him to stand on his feet and throw his crutches away. But remember, Bunyan was a pastoral realist. He never threw them away till he got to the riverside. Some people, you're just going to keep them on their crutches, and being on their crutches is better than crawling on the ground on their faces. And the Spirit of God alone can determine the measure to which your efforts are blessed. Then you will be careful not to cut people off prematurely, from ongoing counsel, just like you don't cut them off from your preaching. I've had people who say, Pastor Martin, preaching for year after year in one place to some of the same unconverted faces, Sunday by Sunday, month by month, year by year. How do you do it without just getting exasperated? I said, you come every Sunday and say, God can get them today. God may get them today. And you pray that he'll get them. And you preach with expectancy and with all of your being, 
never knowing when God may so work. Furthermore, neither will you keep on for an inordinate length of time when it's evident no progress is being made, that the Bible does have a doctrine of shaking dust off your feet and not casting your pearls before swine. So we've got to balance those and ask God to give us wisdom. Then, if there is divine blessing and we see sins being mortified, graces being cultivated, marriages being healed, lives being transformed, if we really believe that this is the fruit not of our cleverness and our experience and our insights, but of the work of God the Holy Spirit, we will be careful not to take credit to ourselves. We will remind ourselves in a very conscious way that it is God who gives the increase. Well, may the Lord write upon our hearts these things as we think of them, wrestle with them, pray for light and grace, that our counseling will be marked by those presuppositions within which alone effective biblical counsel can be carried on. Let's pray and ask the Lord so to help us. Father, we're so thankful again for the richness of your word. We thank you for the sufficiency of your word. We thank you as well for what you have revealed and continue to reveal in general revelation, in what you continue to make accessible to us in your common grace. Teach us, Lord, to be in that sense true biblical integrationist, integrating into our biblical knowledge every valid expression of general revelation, every gift of common grace. We would despise nothing that you make available to us that we might minister to your people. Thank you, Father, for helping the men to stay alert through this lengthy lecture. Thank you for quickening my mental powers and physical powers. We trace these gifts back to your open hand and we say not unto us, not unto us, but unto your name. Be praise and honor and glory. Receive then our thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.